This material is made available to you by or on behalf of the University of Melbourne under Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. It may be subject to copyright. For more information, visit the University Copyright website. All right, I'm just going to uh, start recording now. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining uh, today's uh, seminar. Uh, it's a really pleasure to introduce uh, our colleague, uh, Peter Irwin. Uh, Excuse me. Uh, Peter, uh, I know Peter for almost last, uh, I would say, 10 years when I first met with him in Perth at his place for a cup of tea with Ian Beveridge. So I still remember that. Uh, Peter uh, is a small animal uh, medicine specialist, uh, has also worked uh, at Werribee. Uh, some of uh, you know already him, uh, I think. Uh, and then uh, Peter formally retired as a professor from, uh, and also head of school from Murdoch Uni. Uh, and uh, his passion is on vector-borne diseases of uh, companion animals. And today he's going to talk about some of his work on emerging tick-borne diseases of companion animals. Thank you, Peter, for joining. Over to you. Thank you very much. Lovely to be with you. Good afternoon, everybody. Now, can you hear me? Hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Good, good. All right. Let's see if I can get the technology to work. My, uh, we didn't, we didn't test the slides that they could actually advance, did we? That should be fine. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay, well, yes, thanks for the introduction. Um, and as you say, you know, ticks and tick-borne disease have been a passion of mine for a long time. So it's uh, it's really good to be able to have this opportunity to talk a little bit about them. I'm going to focus uh, particularly during this talk on the latest uh, disease to emerge in Australia. That's canine monocytic ehrlichiosis. But I thought I would just start by giving a little bit of an overview of ticks and, and dogs in Australia. Um, I'm not quite sure. I think we have a, a, a mixed audience. Um, and so just a few words about ticks by way of background. And I'll talk a little bit about the, the, the major tick-borne diseases of dogs. I'm only talking about canine diseases today. Um, and then, as I say, focus on ehrlichiosis and of another recently discovered infection. But uh, if you thought you were just going to be able to sit back and uh, drink a cup of tea or coffee or gin and tonic, what time is it in Melbourne? Probably time for a, a glass of something. It's, it's a lunchtime. Um, it's, oh, yes. Well, maybe you shouldn't be drinking anything other than a tea or a coffee. But uh, I've got a quiz for you here. Uh, so which, which of these uh, diseases, uh, canine diseases, tick-associated diseases of dogs, do you think is the odd one out, if you like, or the exception? But more importantly, why? So the diseases are listed there on the left-hand side, babesiosis, ehrlichiosis, the hematrop hematropic mycoplasmas, anaplasmosis, tick paralysis, and hepatozoonosis. And I'll let you think about that for a few minutes while I just progress with um, a little bit of introduction about ticks. So as I'm sure, most of you know these are, are arachnids, um, they're, they're not insects, um, and the suborder Ixodida is divided into uh, two main families, the, the hard ticks, the Ixodidae, and the Argacidae, the soft ticks, and they comprise the vast majority. There's just one outlier, the Natalia die, uh, one species of, of tick that happens to fall into this family. But uh, uh, for, the most, for the most part, the hard ticks and soft ticks are the ones that concern us. And to a large extent, it's the hard ticks as a group that are most significant in terms of uh, pathogenicity and disease transmission. Now, within this large group of ticks, there are approximately uh, 69 species that are native to Australia, which is quite a sizable proportion, actually. And, uh, of, uh, and then in addition to that, there are five species of tick introduced into Australia, and I'll talk more about that as we go along. So ticks are blood feeding ectoparasites. They live um, on the skin. During the course of them uh, biting, 
and feeding, they transmit pathogens um, and they trigger immune responses in the hosts from which they're feeding. And they had a, have a wide range of vertebrate hosts. These are usually wildlife um, and therefore um, companion animals or domesticated animals and people can become uh, infected when they encroach into the, the wildlife tick habitat. But there are a few species of tick that have become adapted to um, domestic animals and these themselves cause economic and uh, emotional cost um, when they uh, cause disease. Ticks have four life stages, uh, eggs, larvae, nymphs, and adults. And most ticks are what are referred to as three host. In other words, each of the main stages, the larva, the nymphs, or the adults, uh, feed and then drop off the host into the environment, molt, and then seek another host. So during that, um, a molting period when the tick is in the environment, they're particularly susceptible to environmental conditions. Um, but also it means that the total life cycle from egg to adult may take a very long time, may take years, uh, depending on the climatic conditions. When they're seeking a, a new host, they have several different tactics, uh, sometimes referred to as questing or, or ambush, uh, but whichever way they do it, they look for the, their host. This is a, a very short video. This is not an Australian tick. This is uh, a North American tick, but uh, just to remind you, they scuttle around like this, and this is a, a questing tick um, looking for a passing, passing animal. So as I said, there are quite a few, nearly 70 indigenous uh, native tick species um, comprising four, four genera. Um, and they've evolved like our unique wildlife in relative isolation. So phylogenetically, they're, they're pretty distinct. Uh, and for the most part, these 69 or 70 species of tick occur only in Australia, some in New Guinea. And then there are a few, um, for example, ticks of seabirds that do travel um, from the Southern Hemisphere to the Northern Hemisphere and where those traveling seabirds go. But a take home message that I think is really important for understanding tick-borne diseases, such as we understand them in Australia, is that the ticks here are very different to ticks that have been studied elsewhere in the world, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere. We do not, for example, have our own native species of Ripicephalus, uh, Dermacenter or Hyaloma. And the first two of those uh, genera are certainly very important for disease transmission overseas. So there have been five species of tick then introduced uh, with domestic animals. And for the most part, as far as we understand, these have come in in the last 232 years, whatever it is since European settlement. And you can see on the right here, some images of the introduced animals they came with. And I say introduced with domestic animals, well, we shouldn't really call a fox or a rat a domestic animal, but but uh, the, the point is that these ticks came in with those um, hosts and were imported into Australia. So I come back to the question that I posed a few moments ago, which um, of these disease, uh, tick associated diseases is the exception and importantly, why? Well, hopefully you all got full marks by realizing that tick paralysis is the odd one out here, if you like. Um, and I think there are two reasons. The, the point I really want to make is that tick paralysis um, is the only disease that is caused by native or uh, indigenous tick species, and it's caused by the paralysis tick, the eastern paralysis tick, Ixodes holocycus and um, cornuatus. Um, 
the other answer that you could have given, of course, is that, well, tick paralysis is not, is not an infectious disease. It's caused by a toxin, whereas the other five are infectious diseases. So I'll, I'll pay all of those answers. But all of the other five diseases here are transmitted by the ticks that were introduced with the domestic animals. And the one that I'm going to concentrate on because it is by far and away the most important is the brown dog tick. It's an extremely effective vector of disease. And these are images taken um, in Townsville, uh, the top two images of quite a heavy burden of ticks in the ear and the feet. These are the, the predilection sites for the brown dog tick. Um, and uh, the image on the right there, at the bottom right, shows uh, males and females and one little nymph. The brown dick dog tick um, actually has had quite a makeover in recent years and has been re-described using both morphological characters and genetic markers. For, for many years, um, I think we, we all thought that the brown dog tick was just the brown dog tick, regardless of whereabouts in the world it occurred. However, important, I guess, for this discussion as well, is that it was known that in certain parts of the world, particularly Europe, for example, one of the major diseases transmitted by the brown dog tick is canine ehrlichiosis. Well, canine ehrlichiosis is quite well known quite common important disease in the eastern part of the Mediterranean, around Israel, Greece, and uh, Egypt, but rarely occurs in Spain, Italy, for example, less common in Italy. Um, and yet, despite that, the brown dog tick is prevalent throughout the whole area. And this began to uh, raise questions about whether the brown dog tick really was just the brown dog tick or whether there were different uh, subspecies. Um, and over time, both, as I say, morphologically and molecularly, it's been found that there are indeed two distinct lineages of this tick, uh, referred to as the temperate lineage and the tropical lineage, sometimes also known as the southern and northern lineages. And those uh, those two terms uh, actually come from a South American perspective. So the, the, su the, the southern lineage is the more cold temperate lineage, whereas the tropical is the northern parts of South America, of course, are in the tropics. Um, and as if that's not confusing enough, the brown dog tick Ripocephalus sanguineus has also undergone um, a name change and has recently been renamed as Ripocephalus linei. Now, what's all this got to do with my talk today? Well, uh, it would be important to know which type of Ripocephalus we have in Australia since the lineage uh, is important with respect to vectorial capacity. And to date, there's no evidence of the Ripocephalus sanguineus sensu strictu, that's the temperate lineage here. Um, the, all the work would go to show that it's the tropical lineage. And this is interesting, not only for people who like ticks, but uh, also it, it raises the question when the when did this tick arrive and how did this tick arrive? Because um, I, I think it was widely assumed it had probably come uh, in the last 250 odd years, 230 years, again with European settlement. Um, but the dingo was the only large placental carnivore on the continent for a very long time. Um, and it, it, is a, it is a dog that uh, will certainly carry these ticks. Uh, and so the question now is that if, this, if we do have the tropical lineage here, uh, maybe this did come with the dingo and has been here for much longer than uh, originally thought. Um, be interesting to see if anybody listening today has any further insights on that. So the range of the brown dog tick in Australia, Ripocephalus linei, uh, is broadly tropical and subtropical. There have been a number of studies over the last few years. We've done some um, from Murdoch University and some have been done also out of Sydney. Um, and the image on the right uh, gives a, 
a sort of rough idea, if you like, of where where this tick can be found. So extending, you know, throughout all of the Northern Territory in Queensland, but extending into Northern New South Wales, Northern South, Northern parts of South Australia, and through tr tropical Northern WA and down the, the coast. But the problem with a map like this, of course, um, is that there'll be many other places, certainly in the more Northern regions where it occurs yet, yet don't uh, fit within that area. So moving on now to the companion animal tick-borne diseases, the infectious diseases. This is an overview with a timeline of their occurrence and their development over the last uh, 20 or 30 years. Um, and you can see um, here that uh, PCR became uh, the technique that has greatly improved our ability to detect many of these organisms because generally uh, they are subclinical, they're sometimes referred to as stealth organ organisms for, for the large part, and um, PCR has greatly enhanced our ability to detect it. And in fact, if I take out the Mycoplasma haemocanus that was found in 1971, but really not seen again for the best part of 30 or 40 years, you can see this very large gap that occurred between the original discovery of the first canine vector-borne disease, which was Babesia vogeli. Back then, it was called Babesia canis, um, and then Anaplasma platys. But uh, P PCR has greatly enhanced our ability to find some of these organisms. And indeed, as I'll explain a little bit later, some have been discovered only by PCR initially before being seen uh, microscopically. So the first uh, disorder, I'm just going to run through very quickly, give you a, a, a very short uh, explanation or overview of each of these um, diseases. Canine babesiosis was the, the first that was discovered here in Australia. 1966 by Hill and Bolton up in uh, the northern tropics. Um, and uh, it's transmitted by the brown dog tick, as are all of these. Um, and it's uh, considered by world standards a relatively mild Babesia pathogen. Um, there are others, such as in South, South Africa and the European species are very much more pathogenic. But nevertheless, this is a serious infection in young pups up to an age of about 12 weeks old, in which it causes severe anemia and is, is uh, fatal in some cases. The organisms there, um, uh, red blood cell parasite lives in the red blood cells. Um, interesting, the, the second uh, Babesia was the next uh, cab off the rank. Um, and uh, this organism has been certainly um, discovered, you know, within Australia, particularly in uh, Victoria and the East Coast. And whereas it can be and is transmitted by ticks in other parts of the world, this has this organism has gained some degree of notoriety as being associated with blood transmission during fighting. So it's, uh, it has been seen sometimes as a proxy for, uh, for discovering dogs that have, might have been involved in, in fighting. Not necessarily illegal type dog fighting, but uh, it's been found in some dogs that have normal dogs, or as I say, dogs that are not involved in illegal fighting, having uh, being bitten by dogs that are carrying this infection. So it's been transmitted around the world in certain breeds of dogs. The, the, the dogs that are used for fighting, like American Staffordshire Bull Terriers, Pit Bull Terriers, and the like. And of course, in most parts of the world, uh, that uh, practice is, is banned, as it should be. Um, but uh, it's a it's a difficult disease to study because um, in most countries the the owners of such dogs are, are not very willing to submit their their dogs to study 
uh, for, for obvious reasons. But we do have Babesia gibsoni infection in Australia, but not very commonly reported. And then there are other bacteria, there are bacterial infections, um, hematropic mycoplasma, for example. This is the very first one that was discovered. It, again, it was called something different back in 1971. Um, it's called Hemobartonella canis back then. It, it, the microbiologists have been at it and it's been renamed um, over the years to now being mycoplasma hemocanis. Um, it, it also isn't very pathogenic, um, but in dogs that um, either become immunocompromised through a cancer treatment, for example, or particularly if they are splenectomized, have their spleen removed, then this can cause a hemolytic anemia. And there are several different species of these hematropic mycoplasma. These are bacteria, um, mostly are transmitted again by the brown dog tick, as opposed to the feline hematropic mycoplasma, which is transmitted by fleas. But we have a number of different species of these organisms now recognized in Australia. Way back in 2001, um, another bacterial tick transmitted disease was identified. This is anaplasmosis. And it caused quite a lot of excitement at the time because, again, back then it had a different name. This was originally referred to as Ehrlichia platis. Um, and so that uh, editorial that was written in uh, 2001 got everybody terribly excited um, referring to canine ehrlichiosis in Australia. Well, indeed, back then it was an ehrlichiosis, not canine monocytic ehrlichiosis, not the really nasty one. Um, but uh, this is Anaplasma platis, which uh, is uh, an, another relatively mild pathogen, but very common throughout the north of Australia. And as I say, its name has changed over the years. Chronologically, the next organism to be identified was Hepatozoan canis, but I'll come back to that in a moment because I want to spend the next 10 minutes just talking about Ehrlichia and Ehrlichiosis, which is the, the most serious tick-borne disease of all of these I'm speaking about um, and the most recent one to arrive in Australia. So as I expect most people know, this was originally identified in Kununurra, Northern WA, in 2020, in April, May. That seems a long time ago now, doesn't it? Um, and it has, over the last two years, become endemic, certainly throughout the Northern Territory and Northern WA, and is rapidly spreading across North Queensland. It's uh, considered to be well established now in the Mount Isa region and in communities north of Mount Isa and in the, the southern Gulf country there. Um, since its first identification, we've had at least um, a, well, well over a thousand cases reported. It's a notifiable disease as well in Australia. So vets are obliged to report suspected cases and, and have it confirmed. The disease, uh, this is a disease of canids generally, uh, domestic dogs particularly, but also wild canids. And it's caused by a bacterial infection. Ehrlichia canis, this is a form of rickettsial organism that once it gets into the blood after having been transmitted by the tick, makes its way to a certain group of cells, the monocytes and macrophages. Uh, where it multiplies it's an intracellular organism, multiplies in these groups and causes inclusions like you can see in this image there. It becomes widely disseminated through the animal's body um, and induces a massive antibody response. But the antibodies for the large part are non-protective and troublesome in so far as they cause unwanted pathology, such as immune complex formation, which in turn leads to widespread inflammation, which underpins the, the disease severity and the clinical signs. The transmission of Ehrlichia canis is um, quite rapid compared, for example, to Babesia, which takes several days to be transmitted by an engorging tick. 
EKness is transmitted within about three hours of the tick attaching. And that's a whole new paradigm um, for vets in Australia because um, of how we then protect dogs against this disease. It's also transmitted mechanically by male ticks. So male Ripicephalus sanguinis, male brown dog ticks have a habit of um, traveling quite fast around um, the surface of a dog's body and looking for female ticks and, and also will quite easily and willingly um, hop. That's, they don't hop, but they, they move from one dog to another quite rapidly in search of females. And as they go, they feed a little bit here and feed a little bit there. They, they don't engorge in the same way as a female tick does, but they take small bites of blood. And it has been shown that male ticks can transmit this infection mechanically from one dog to another by feeding on an infected dog and moving to an uninfected dog. In addition to that, um, co-transmission is very common because the brown dog tick is the vector tick. I've already shown you a list of a number of other agents that are transmitted by this tick. And so co-infection is often seen with a lichia canis. The whole genome has been uh, analyzed, of, of a lichia canis has been analyzed, um, and it's been shown that the strain, if you like, of E. canis that we have here in Australia is referred to as the Taiwan genotype that is common throughout Asia um, and the Middle East. And the study that was done by Neve um, et al. out of um, uh, CSRO in Geelong have shown that uh, the, all the isolates that they studied throughout quite large geographical areas, so the Northern Territory, Northern Western Australia, um, South Australia, all the isolates were, were identical, which perhaps would be consistent with a recent introduction, as we suspect, um, and a rapid spread of that um, isolate. However, what is not known is the exact time, date, um, uh, and even the location of the original incursion. As I said earlier, the, the first cases were diagnosed in Kununurra, but it's not known whether that part of Western Australia was where it first occurred, where it first came into the country. It is a, a really serious disease of dogs. Um, and the reason for that is that it uh, has fairly, certainly within Australia at the moment, unique epidemiological features. However, as I think I said just now, the immune response to E. canis is non-productive and in fact counterproductive. So we get a whole load of pathology associated with infection, unwanted pathology. And um, treatment is also unfortunately not 100% effective. The disease has had an absolutely devastating um, effect on uh, dogs within indigenous communities and the indigenous communities more broadly, um, where very high tick burdens are evident. Um, and there have been mainly anecdotal reports of severe morbidity and mortality. So, so many sick dogs and high mortalities um, in those communities and associated with this rapid spread across the top end. And if you like, it's it's been a perfect storm. I believe we 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 have we have had for many years a very well established tick population throughout northern Australia. And remember, this is Ripicephalus lineae, or the tropical lineage, which is an extremely good vector for Lichia canis. So it's all the ticks have just been waiting for this to happen, if you like. Um, and the the climatic conditions. Uh, in the north um, are perfect for the tick uh, and in indigenous communities tick control has been uh, suboptimal I guess and so as you saw from those pictures I showed a few minutes ago some dogs can have very heavy burdens of ticks but more importantly this is a, a tick that is adapted to dwellings and so within the buildings within the kennels within people's homes in northern Australia there are 
often quite large numbers of ticks. So we have this large population of ticks. Uh, we have a naive dog population that's naive with respect to a lichia and in comes a lichia. So we've had this epidemic, if you like, with high casualties. And speaking of high casualties, um, this is this is analogous, I believe, to the situation uh, in Southeast Asia in the mainly 60s and 70s, where many uh, military working dogs, generally German shepherds, were brought into that part of the world as part of the Indochina War, Vietnam War, and there were enormous numbers of casualties, deaths amongst these military dogs. And it was a similar situation with differences, if you like. There was an established tick population, but those ticks carried a Lichia canis. And into this, um, into rural Vietnam, came this population of naive uh, American, British, Australian military working dogs. And as I say, there was enormous casualties. And it's really quite instructive to read back on those original papers in the um, late 1960s and during the 1970s initially it really wasn't known why their dogs were dying these were important for military purposes i guess and uh, there was a high mortality amongst these dogs um, and if you read the clinical descriptions at the time there are very great similarities with what's been seen in the uh, Aboriginal communities and across Northern Australia over the last couple of years. Um, uh, this isn't really a, a talk about clinical disease, but I think what will happen over, over time is as the dog population in increases its immunity and exposure to the parasite, to the, to the bacterium, um, it will probably develop into a situation like in other parts of the world now, where that it's always been a serious disease, but there's a certain endemic stability. Um, the clinical signs of a lichia um, can be quite severe, as I've as I've discussed, but generally also quite non-specific. So the, the dogs could be just generally unwell, lethargic losing weight. They usually have quite a high fever. And then there could be a number of other um, slightly more specific signs or very obvious signs, eye disease, they become pale, they become anemic, they become pale. And very, um, very obviously and distressingly for the owners, they get uh, bleeding problems. So they bleed from their noses. And I have a series of pictures here for you. Uh, taken by colleagues um, in the northern parts of Australia, mainly uh, through AMRIC, the wonderful uh, organization AMRIC, and also by uh, John Beadle in Broome, who's a vet in Broome. You can see here dogs with eye problems, these cloudy eyes. The, the, the dogs with bleeding issues, they can bleed profusely from their noses, epistaxis, um, so much so that they can die of blood loss um, from hemorrhage, uh, but they also be, become uh, edematous swelling. They get swelling of, of their neck, their general body, um, the scrotum, interestingly. Um, and again, that's as a, as a clinical sign was reported widely during the Vietnam conflict and the vets who were treating those dogs, but has hardly ever been seen or reported since. I just find it interesting, this, this um, similarity that we find ourselves in now compared to back then. The dogs become very skinny. Um, they're very susceptible to infection. The dog on the left there had just got a cut in its foot because its bone marrow was uh, impacted. It was unable to mount an immune response. That dog died of sepsis as, um, as a consequence of the infection. As I said, said a few minutes ago, it is a notifiable disease. So currently, I expect that will change fairly soon. Now it's becoming endemic. But um, until now, and including now, it is mandated that vets test suspected cases. 
Um, but the challenge, the challenge is that we don't have a, a very good, what I'd call cage side or in clinic test available at the moment. Um, and hopefully that'll be something that research will, will um, provide vets with a, with a good test in, in coming months to years. The disease is treatable with antibiotics. So the do drug that's used is doxycycline. Um, however, it's not 100% effective. Um, and a small number of dogs, um, for whatever reason, the organism uh, survives in treated dogs and can persist. So it really becomes very important to, to prevent infection. And the very rapid transmission of this pathogen from the brown dog tick necessitates a strategy that's a little bit different to the main strategies, for example, that are used for paralysis tick. And I'll explain as we go. So there's a new, newish group of drugs, the isoxazolines or the isoxazolines, which are really excellent acaricides. They, they, they kill ticks very efficiently. However, um, they, they work systemically. So the tick has to be attached and has to be feeding on the dog in order to be killed. And that dynamic is too slow for the prevention of the transmission of E. canis because that's transmitted within three hours. So specifically for this infection and this disease, you need um, a, dr a drug or a, a compound that is repellent, has a repellency action and kills the ticks before they bite. Um, and the drugs that contain, sorry, the, the uh, products that contain flumethrin, uh, for example, or permethrin have that property. So in, in communities managing outbreaks, um, the the collar, so Soresto is the only uh, product that is licensed for the prevention of oleochiosis in Australia, um, is should be used with an isoxazolin. Um, but in a in a positive dog to prevent onward transmission, an isoxazolin on its own would be fine. But it 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 really has. Uh, I guess challenged vets thinking about about how to protect dogs against diseases transmitted by ticks. Um, so vets in practice have had to revisit their parasitology, which of course is a really good thing. Okay, just finally, uh, before we wind up, um, I wanted to tell you one more sort of interesting story. I think I think it's interesting about the, the one of the last. Um, tick-borne diseases has been discovered here. This is hepatozoan canis. Um, I have a personal sort of interest in this because my PhD student at the time uh, made this discovery. And it, it, uh, it sort of illustrates, I think, how, how nationwide surveys now based molecularly with PCR um, you know, can be very useful and turn up things you don't expect. So, a few years ago, five, six years ago, we were doing a, a nationwide study of, of ticks, ticks in Australia, a tick survey, if you like. And uh, we were collecting ticks from all around the country, so vets and uh, well, anybody, uh, dog owners, uh, were collecting ticks for us. And uh, we published all this work, of course. But um, one of the ticks that was taken one day um, off a little dog, this beautiful little puppy here is a Marema sheep dog. This was in Serena in mid mid north coast uh, Queensland. This little dog had tick paralysis. Um, fortunately, wasn't too unwell with it, was treated appropriately and survived. But the tick that was causing the tick paralysis, paralysis tick, Exodes holocyclus, was removed and submitted for our research. Um, we eventually got around to analyzing what was in those ticks. And to our great surprise, we found hepatozoan canis. And, and again, I like this, um, this example or this little story because 
it combines the new and the old. So we discovered it unseen by PCR. And because we had good records, we were able to contact the vet and go back and eventually find the owner of this individual dog, who was a very nice lady, and the dog was still alive. It had survived from its uh, tick paralysis. It was now a couple of years later, a very fine Marama sheepdog. And we uh, got permission to take a, a blood sample from the dog. We looked in its blood. And sure enough, sitting in its blood two or three years later was the organism. I don't know if you can see my the arrow here, but you can see the the organism within our white blood cells. So that's hepatosome canis. And it made a nice, nice story. We'd confirmed it um, molecularly, and then we could actually see it in the dog's blood. So hepatosome canis is, as you might suspect from the story, not a very pathogenic organism. It's another parasite of canids, um, but particularly foxes. So it's a it's a it's an organism that is transmitted between foxes by ticks, usually the ingestion of the tick rather than the biting of the tick, but it can also be transmitted uh, by predation and vertically from mother to offspring. What's really interesting about Hepatozoan canis is that it's not aligned with the tropical lineage of Ripicephalus sanguinis. So it's not aligned with the, the um, the type of brown dog tick that we have here. And so we sort of come full circle to what I was talking about earlier on. Um, the question really is, how did the hepatozoan canis um, come in? Well, we can say it's unlikely with the brown dog ticks because we know that the brown dog tick in Australia is the tropical lineage, and we know that hepatozoan canis is not generally transmitted or associated with that lineage. And therefore, it's probably unlikely that it came in with the, the dingoes originally. So we presume that um, hepatozoan canis came in with dogs rather than ticks, imported into Australia at some stage in the last 230 years. Um, it's possible that it came in with the foxes. I expect there are some people listening to this saying, yes, well, of course, it came in with the foxes, not the dogs, because it's they're the main host. Um, but uh, I think possibly for this little pup that um, had hepatozoan canis, it probably came from its, its mother, where the mother, so it was a, a vertical transmission to the pup almost certainly, because it was a very young dog at the time, hadn't had any tick exposure apart from the paralysis tick that was um, just drinking its blood and acting as, a, as, a, as a, an amplifier for our studies. But um, I th so, that, so I think that pup got it from its, its mother, but where the mother got it from, I don't know. We did, we did try and trace family histories and all that sort of thing, but were unsuccessful in that quest. Well, that brings me to the to the end of my presentation. I hope that uh, I haven't bored you too much, and I hope that uh, that's been of of interest. Um, I would just like to acknowledge and thank the many people, particularly um, with regard to Alikia and the Alikiosis outbreak, who've been involved in in our studies, been involved in collecting samples, who've been involved in informing me. Uh, about it, who've been taking photographs of the, the dogs, and a particular shout out to AMRIC, Animal Management in Rural and Remote Indigenous Communities, just a, a simply wonderful organization, uh, but also other, other vets in the field and to, to Mark Shipp and his department as well. So with that, um, I'll thank you very much and uh, stop sharing. Thank, thank you very much, Peter. Questions for Peter? While people are thinking about question, Peter, can I just ask that uh, vets working in Victoria, what sort of things, I mean, although you have touched on certain things, you know, as a practice, practicing veterinarian, and you have also worked in Victoria as well. So what sort of things now people should be considering in their, you know, kind of uh, list of different diagnostics 
uh, in terms of uh, vector-borne diseases in companion animals? Sure, sure. I, I, I deli deliberately didn't want to make this too much of a, a clinical talk, um, but uh, the question's a really good one, um, and that is that I, I guess vets, you know, one of the one of the really important pieces of um, history we always try and collect is about travel history. So, for for Victorian vets, um, they are they are most likely to encounter dogs with ehrlichiosis if the if the dog has travel history from Northern Australia. So so don't just think that you know this is um, a dog that's been living in Darwin and come to Melbourne. Um, you know we have people you know especially in in post covid times you know more and more people again are beginning to travel so we talk about gray nomads but you know travelers around australia are going up north taking their pets with them taking their dog with them and then coming back to to uh, the southern states um, but in addition to that there are organizations that rehome dogs so rehoming re organizations they're very well aware of elikia and of course are doing it what they can to prevent transmission or prevent spread but but the the first part of the answer to your question is is um the travel history is is critical if you can find out if the dog's been up north and you've got a patient with clinical signs clinical symptoms if you like that that are consistent with elikiosis then always try and find out um, more about its travel history. Um, after that, those those clinical signs, um, you know, are, are what you look out for. And then with some good problem-oriented medicine and approach to to the problems, ruling things out and you know ruling things in is the way to go. But dogs that are febrile um, have bleeding problems, so so. Uh, epistaxis bleeding from the nose or petechial hemorrhages dogs that have low red blood cells white blood cells platelets in particular you know those sorts of hematological abnormalities should raise the the um suspicion of of uh of ehrlichiosis and i've just seen i can i can sorry i can i can now just see all the many people who are who are listening in which is fantastic and i can see amric amric's there so hi amric uh, um, uh, Marshall has raised his hand. Uh, we'll come back to you, Marshall. There's a question uh, in the chat that can you comment on any human transmission, please? Anna is asking. Okay, thanks, Anna. Um, overseas, uh, it has been known that Ehrlichiosis uh, can infect people. Um, these cases have only been reported in South America. And a very small number of, of cases at that. But there, there were a couple of really quite good studies uh, 10, 15 years ago to show a small number of people had um, the, the South American strain, if you like, of Ehrlichia canis. Um, so, so there is a zoonotic um, association. However, um, the strain, as I said, was South American, not the Taiwan genotype. But um, so I think it's it's very unlikely that the Ehrlichia canis currently in Australia has zoonotic uh, implications or, or risk to people. But you know, uh, there's a lot we don't know about vector-borne diseases. So it is something that I think uh, deserves some research in its own right. Um, but uh, I think the risk, knowing that the the phenotype, the gene, genotypic makeup of the organism is, is very low. Marshall has a question. Mar Marshall. Um, absolutely fabulous talk. Thank you very much. Enjoyed it immensely. Thanks, um, what's your or others' predictions for the impact on dingoes? Yeah, look, that's a really, a really good question and, and potentially really worrying, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I, I know that anecdotally, and I mean, you, you've had a lot more to do with dingoes, I, I'm sure, than me, but anecdotally, they're a, a breed, a, a creature that seems to be relatively resistant to ticks. I'm mean, I, hesitant to say that, but but uh, because brown dog ticks have been found on dingoes, of course, but but um, they they don't seem to be tremendously good hosts for the brown dog tick uh, but that said um, uh, 
they're, they're a dog um, and they theoretically are, are going to be susceptible. Um, I think one of the, the the big problems with the domestic dog situation is the very, very large numbers of ticks in small confined areas like we're seeing in the, in, in indigenous communities in the north at the moment. So it's, it's sort of um, the, the transmission is, is, is there's a very high infectious load, very high transmission rate to the dog domestic dogs and I suspect that that won't uh, um, repeat itself very well within the the dingo community but the brown dog tick is it can be considered almost like a ridiculous tick you know a nest nest associated tick um, it, it, it it survives so well you know in in sheltered areas around dogs which is why it does so well in homes um, so I think there is potential risk um, for, for the dingo breed. I don't know, perhaps others who are listening might have, have other ideas or other comments or other experience. I haven't yet heard of a, a dingo with a lichiosis, but I guess that'll be a, a tricky diagnosis to make. Perhaps it also depends, you know, how many people have looked at a lichiosis in dingoes first. Yeah. Yeah, well, okay. well, of course, before, I mean, uh, because dingoes don't occur anywhere else in the world, we didn't have a lichiosis here, you know, there's probably no one's looked at it at all yet, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll see, maybe, maybe captive dingoes might get infected and we'll, we'll hear more about it. Thank you. Uh, Liz has, Liz Tudor has a question, how might you expect the disease presentation to change as Ehrlichia becomes endemic? Yeah, that's that's a great question, Liz. Thank you and hello. Um, well, I, I think it will settle into um, an endemic stability, for want of a better word. And if you if you look at the literature and if you talk to vets overseas, um, you know where, where the disease is endemic, they will invariably tell you, oh yes, you know, look, it's it's quite a serious disease, but you know most dogs survive it or we treat it with doxycycline and they get better. And, I, and I'm sure that a similar thing will occur in Australia over time. Unfortunately, we're, we're just going to have to live with it. But what has been so extraordinary is this um, is, is this combination of the, the ticks and the dogs and the situation in uh, in the northern parts of Australia that that um, I think have only really ever been seen once before and well described, as I said, in the, during the Vietnam War. But uh, it'll, it, it will become a, a widespread disease that all vets will have to have on the differential diagnosis list. They'll have to have it in the back of their mind. And as I said to a pre answer to a previous question, you know, dogs with strange hematological abnormalities or fever of unknown origin, you know, those sorts of things, then vector-borne diseases should always be on the list and uh, differential diagnosis list and alichia now becomes more prominent. Great, thank you. Any other question for Peter? If no other question, I would uh, like to thank you, Peter. Uh, for for fantastic talk and also spending time, we are really grateful for that, and uh, hope to see you soon at some ESP conferences or something like that. Thank you very much. Lovely to give the talk. Uh, thank you very much for attending. And great to see so many familiar names and and uh, people Thanks I used very much. to used to know. Thanks very much, everybody. Take care. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye. Bye.